And now back to the show. One of the things that I was thinking about when you're talking about like the, the ongoing journey is, and like connecting to people um, and sharing these stories and experiences is how important that connection is and how this current pandemic has you know, in in some ways made it much more difficult and at the very least shifted our, how we connect with people and how we share these stories. So I'm curious how the current pandemic has shifted your work or has it shifted your work? It absolutely has shifted the work. If I don't know if there's anyone out there that can say that it hasn't shifted their work. Um, but I also think that it's almost, it's, it's also, I think it was kind of, I don't want to say the pandemic was necessary, but the moment to take a step back and reflect has been really, really good. Um, It shifted in the work because, because our organization really did have a strong focus and an emphasis on relational um, relationships and relational work. So we, we, you know, a big thing is we had a huge gathering on the land every summer and we tried to like have like strategy sessions and conversations with folks. And we were trying, we were like last year, we were supposed to be launching like seven community engagement sessions across the country and doing all this stuff with youth and like doing all this training. And obviously that it's the kind of stuff that you can't even do online because you can't, you can't have these types of trainings or conversations through Zoom. And so that's really forced us to like, think about like, okay, so what can we do now? But I think that that pause in like being in the hamster wheel of trying to like keep up with like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What do we got to train people on? And just like really sort of digging deep and like reconnecting um, with ourselves and what our work is and what our purpose is and how we, how we achieve the goals that we set out to, you know, prior to the pandemic has been really kind of kind of nice to to just have a moment to just I, I don't want to say slow down because I don't think anyone's I mean I don't feel like things have slowed down it's just different it's a different kind of pace where you're not like hustling for so for me I spent I've spent the better part the part of the last 10 years constantly on the move constantly like somewhere like I was always somewhere I was like oh where am I going next um like who, who like what what protest am I going to now? And, and I, and I did that not because like, I'm a, oh God, I, I'm not a, what there's like a tour activism sort of thing. Like, that's not what I do, but like, I, I spend a lot of time going to meetings and then being like, oh, there's a frontline event happening there. I might as well go to that too. And the, these were really tiring. It was tiring to always be feeling like I was physically having to be somewhere and be somewhere and be somewhere. And that really conti- like it contributed to like this disassociation that we constantly have, particularly when you have to constantly keep like saying the same thing over and over again. And a lot of the times these spaces, particularly like white environmental spaces, they want to hear the story, the, the trauma story. They don't want to talk about the joy and the fun. They don't want to talk about the time you fucked up and like what you learned from it. They want to hear about like how your family is like all dying and like how your land has disappeared and how you're so broken inside. Like the, it's trauma porn, but that trauma porn is like literally perpetuating harm. Like we, when you do that to someone, you're literally re-triggering their trauma in them. And I don't think that there's like, I don't think that these communities understand the harm that they're actually doing to our communities to constantly keep us in a state of wanting to sell our pain to these movement spaces for money. And I've been seeing a shift within COVID because like, we can't do this anymore. So it's like, so what are you doing? Oh, we want to like heal the community because like human health is so important all of a sudden within the pandemic. And now we're seeing this shift to these people being like, oh, we want to like support like healing justice. We want to support like communities, like care packages and aid. This is the stuff we should have freaking been doing because our communities can't topple systems if they're sick and constantly having to move and constantly being like triggered and put into their trauma all the time. And so the, the pandemic has like been kind of kind of good in the sense that it's forced a society at large to reevaluate not just what's important, but like how we actually achieve the ends to our goals. And one of the biggest things is that human health 
individually and communi communally is super critical. Uh, but it's also put a huge focus on the fact that we also can't do this stuff without community and that community is critical and that it's, it's, it's also playing a toll on the fact that like we can't have those communal spaces anymore. And that is, it's, it's really, it's on some, for some people, it's been really, really hard for their, for their mental health and their spiritual well being to not be able to go to ceremonies, to not be able to like go to those feasts or to that conference and like sit and have the face to face conversation with folks. And like those relational exchanges are really critical to fostering creativity, to fostering solutions to problems. And we're not in that space. So I think we're like almost like in this like hibernation where we need to to try to make the best of this situation and to reflect on ways that we can rebalance ourselves and how we reemerge from this moment, from this hibernation from the world in a way that's gonna be even more powerful. And I really hope that it is not just getting back into that same cycle of like trauma, travel, trauma, travel, trauma, travel. Uh, it's like, yes, we need to fight. Yes, we need to show up on the front lines. Yes, we need to stop those machines that are coming and they're gonna destroy the land or, you know, stop that bill that's going to be super oppressive. But we also need to focus on the fact that like, we've learned a lot that human health is critical. And human health isn't just about, you know, taking medicine and taking a bath. It's also about those relational exchanges, and about those spaces that foster creativity. And I hope to hell that we see more investment in communal exchanges and places that foster these creativity and foster healing rather than exchanges that are propping up stories of trauma. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a really lovely connection. Um, I'm with you on hoping that the that focus on healing in a deeper, deeper way continues to grow and, <clears throat> and blossom and live beyond um, COVID. Um, you had mentioned earlier about the, the voice versus power. And one of the things, this is kind of a new question for um, our listeners, uh, something a former guest brought up, um, Marina Sutrin, about this inability for things to scale over. Like, so for example, right now, um, you know, we're, see we're seeing, we saw early on in COVID that there was a massive outgrowth of mutual aid um, and, and grassroots care happening um, at, at a level that's never been seen before, um, pre-capitalism, pre-empire. Um, and, uh, but it's not, but it didn't scale over. It kind of fizzled, has fizzled out a bit. And um, one of the questions we are we're interested in asking folks is, are, you know, what gets in the way of that power, that power, that collective power, the, um, I think that's the question. Is that the question, Eleanor? <laughs> Yeah, it's basically like, why haven't we been able to scale over? And is it is something is there something connected to like, are we afraid of accessing that our own power? Or can we are we having a hard time accessing our power? I don't know if either of you have read um, Jack Forbes's book, Columbus and Other Cannibals. It's it's he, he wrote it, I believe, in like 1976 or 78. Like it was, it's quite old. It's very short. It's a very easy read. Um but he talks about colonialism as being a, a disease, a disease of the mind. And he equates it to an Algonquin sort of legend, deity, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, like story uh, uh, and of, of the Wittico. And the Wittico, the, the, the story of the Wittico is like, Wittico was like a cannibal, kind of like a cannibal, um, but in sort of, modern man pre-modern man histories when like there were sort of like deities and animals and they all talked together this this deity or this like demigod um he, the Wittigo he just he want he saw the power of all the animals and he wanted to he wanted that power so he started to eat them and there were men, like man, like not men, but there were humans, other, I should say, there were other humans living on, on the earth at the time. And he saw like their love and compassion and all these things. And he wanted that too. And he started to eat the man or the humans. And so it's this idea that 
colonialism is the same is the same thing. And the reason I bring this up in relation to your question is that what gets in the way? One of the lines in his book that I love, which I'm probably going to butcher right now, is that he talks about how one of the one of the curses or one of the challenges of the epidemiology of this disease of the mind, the Wittigo disease, is how he equates it to, is that sometimes in our in our journey to to like to get rid of it, we end up succumbing to it. And that no one is immune from the wheat to goat disease. Like, it's not like, it's not like just because like I'm indigenous that somehow like I know the answers and I'm not gonna like become a cannibal. Um, And so he just talks about like how like that is one of the greatest challenges is that like even in our journey to try to uncouple these systems, we sometimes like fall victim to them ourselves. And I think it's so powerful when we talk about like, why haven't we like gotten over that, like, you know, toppled over the power structures? Why haven't that, how, why hasn't the pendulum shifted? And, and you see it, you see it in the professionalism of this, of this work. You see it in the way that like activism is now a career choice. Like it just feels so gross to like, think about these things. And then it becomes like, how much, are you, how much is that person getting paid? And then we get caught up in these structures of like capitalism and like who has and who has not. And we end up not seeing the enemy anymore. Um, and that's, that's, that's challenging because then we, we are just replicating those same systems that we are a part of. And, you know, I think like one of the, the most pertinent things from that book, he doesn't have, it's not like there's like some happy ending that he gives you the solution to the destroying the wheat to go disease, but he just talks like, it's a really good book because he talks about the history of the colonizations of the Americas as well within it. But that within those structures, like we have to, we have to recognize that this is a disease and that with diseases, just like we're finding with COVID is that if we, if we all put our minds together, we can find solutions. We can find either things that help to deal with like treating it once you've caught it, or we can find ways to inoculate it. And, you know, he doesn't give those answers in the book, but the reality is, is that I think that if we can be more in community, if we can recognize that this is a disease, like they, so in recovery, the first step is like admitting. Um, we have to admit that even the most radical activist is probably like been exposed to this disease and it's currently trying to like, you know, take over and that you probably have done harm. You probably have oppressed somebody else. You, you have to admit to yourself that you are fallible and that like we have to find ways to recognize that we can't like be rigid in our radicalism as Carla talks about in her book but also that we have to like recognize that like it's our responsibility to know and our to have humility to move forward in this stuff and and I, I do think that that ego um and and being c- caught up and and pulled into empire or being taken over by the wheat go disease is is part of that is why we haven't gotten to those spaces it's why people get voices and then they start to look for power but they're looking for power within the confines of those same structures so how do we create power outside of those structures how do we look to create alternatives that aren't replicating those structures and systems personally <laughs> for me i just like we have to listen to the land and that comes from a teaching for me growing up. I remember, I remember like one of my, one of these really fond memories. And then I heard another person from my community talk about this in a documentary that he's been involved in. His name's Robert Granjam, really great stuff. But when his dad took him out on the land and when my dad took us out onto the land, it's not like there was like this teaching, like, this is the plant, this is the medicine, this is the track, this is what you do. This is, this is how I was taught. Shh. Listen. And that's it. You listen. And you learn to listen to a different vibration and a different language that's being spoken. And those things teach you something. They teach you humility. They teach you to like know that you are a part of these structures and systems. And when you see that you are like nothing but a mere creature on this planet connected to all these things, your perspective of life completely and utterly changes. 
And it's not just about like this, like super wooey, like hippie, like I'm going to go meditate and like go like grow a garden. Suddenly I'm going to be like fucking Buddha and talk to the divine. It's like, again, there's ego playing in that. So like, how do we learn to just like someone just shushes you and tells you to listen and you're like, listen to what? It's like, there are, there's so much more that we don't understand that we don't hear. And I think that is the stuff that we need to tap into in order to really start to topple those structures and systems because we need to stop listening to them. We need to stop reacting to them and we need to start listening and reacting to the things that have been trying to speak to us for the last 500 plus years since colonization has come over to try to mute those voices that spoke to us for generations before. I, I'm glad yeah. that I have like my, my microphone on mute because there have been so many times during this that I've wanted to scream fuck yeah really loud and I'm so I'm glad that I'm on mute. Um <laughs> I like and and one of the things that uh I think that's really powerful is kind of the this idea of not like going back, but it's kind of like a rebirth, like the like a a, a renaissance if we want to use a uh <laughs> that word, but going back to to understanding previous relationships to the world and, and and then our place in the ecosystem as opposed to like trying to see ourselves as on top of it and then like taking that into the present um, and building a future from that. And so with that, like I'm curious with all of the shit that's going on now <laughs> and all of the shit that has gone down, do you feel hopeful for the future? Do you feel hope and what kind of hope is it and uh do you feel like these kind of shifts happening i mean shifts are undeniable right now um i i do feel like the shifts i mean there's a there's a fundamental shift on a political level there's a fundamental shift on like a environmental level i mean like it's it's been like crazy warm this winter like there is a shift like an undeniable unequivocal shift happening on multiple different like levels and planes and it's scary it it's and i think what's the scariest part about it is like it is so unknown it is so incredibly unknown what that what that future looks like like what does that future look like and you know we have like the eco fascists that are just like humans just need to like fucking die <laughs> um and we're the we're the light on the planet and you know it can feel really easy to say that but the reality is is that we are just as any other creature on this planet we are a creature on this planet um and and we we have purpose and i don't know if we've even figured out what that purpose is as a species <laughs> um i think we've fucked up a bunch of times in trying to figure that out um and and you know and not to say like i'm not like I'm also not saying like, oh, like, we just need to go back to indigenous ways of knowing. Cause like, let's, let's be real. Like there are like indigenous civilizations that grew and fell before colonization. And so we have fallen and failed many a times before, but um, I am, I don't know if hopeful is the right word. People always ask me this question and I'm like, I'm always like, yeah, I'm hopeful for like a new future. I'm expecting a new future. I think that's more that it is. And I don't know what it is. I don't know, like, I think every transition and every rebirth, any birth, rebirth, birth, birth in general is a painful process. I, I always talk about this when people are just like so upset because we're like, you know, trying to have an intersectional meeting and suddenly someone triggers another person and everyone's all like, ah! they're all crying and mad at each other and hate each other. And like, I'm never going to do this again. And everyone's just like pissed, right? I've seen this so many times. And I'm like, what do you expect this to be? So I'm like, we're all going to hold hands and it's all going to be peaceful. That's not how like change happens. That's not how birthing a new movement happens. It's painful and it's messy. And like, you're like, why the hell am I doing this? Like during childbirth, you're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't even move through this moment anymore. I'm going to die. Like, you're just like, you know, you have a few people that are just like, oh, it's ecstatic, it's beautiful. And it, it can be. Uh, it can be it could be but generally it's not like all animals birth it, it's not a like super it's not like you're on like white sheets and all happy together it's messy and it's painful and sometimes emergencies happen and you gotta like intervene 
and you gotta someone's gotta come in and like fix the situation but in the end like if you've given birth after that process and like that that life is passed to you and given to you it is the most beautiful thing in the whole world it is like it is indescribable the kinds of love and emotions that you feel and it is something that you would do anything for and we are talking about transitioning and changing the whole world and if it's not messy and if it's not painful then we're not fucking doing it right and it's whether or not like you're willing to push through that pain it's willing like you and you know breathing properly having the tools to get through it having your support people with you and moving through it and birthing something is going to be hard but in the end whatever it is is going to be just as worth fighting for as all the things that we've done before and it's going to be beautiful and whatever that is i don't know what it is i i have no clue and i shouldn't know and and to claim that you do know is is like you got to let go of some of your ego man Yes. <laughs> I love, I think comparing it to birthing is really important because it is something that we can't do alone. And um, yeah, and it is messy and painful. And, and trauma, I had PTSD after my first child because it was so severe and waited 10 years before I had my second. So <laughs> um, there's also this thing about patience and knowing what your body can do. I mean, it sort of speaks to that land piece. And if you you know, take body into the deeper metaphor of land. Um, I, I have 12 years between my kids. So, I, oh, okay. So, you know, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, where I, I noticed I'm not recognizing the time and there's just so much to say. Um, I, I think we're going to move on to like some recommendations because um, I'm just going to really quickly say like for about 20 or I, about 21 years ago, I was in peace and conflict studies and majoring in genocide studies. And one of the things that every class I took, we, I would get the lineage thrown at me about um, direct uh, action from Thoreau to Gandhi to MLK. And this like important lineage that if we just knew it, we would have it figured out. And I'd be like, bullshit. I want to hear the feminist with the, with the S on the end, feminisms um, lineage. And so I actually took, took a deep dive and emailed my friends from all over the world and, and indigenous women and, and, and all different parts of the world and asked them like, you know, what's your, what was the book? What was the, what got you um, involved in uh, fighting for your land? So I decided to do an environmental kind of land, you know, um, saving us from climate change approach. And I could, there's no, of course, this isn't going to surprise you. There's no, there's no direct lineage. <laughs> it was going to have to be this massive multimedia project and I just let it go. Yeah. And it won't surprise you that one of the things that I found in my research was that women usually get start because either for their children or for their land. Um, and not, not what Gandhi said or what MLK said or what um, <laughs> Thoreau said. So having said all that, um, is there, um, I'm not going to ask about a book right now because you've mentioned a few, but I'm curious about if, is there like feminist, Indigenous feminists from a, either your own community or from um, the larger Turtle Island or the Americas or the world, even name a few, who have inspired your work, uh, who you could point to? So my mom used to, like, feminists were, like, white supremacists <laughs> growing up. And I remember when I told my mom I was, like, doing this feminist training because I did, like, this feminist organizing school training. She was just like, oh, I don't like feminists. Um, so, you know, it took, it took a lot of, like, conversations with my mom to talk about, like, the evolution of feminisms um, with her to, for her to, like, even, like, feel comfortable with it. But if you want to look at like the, the definition of feminism of those, like trying to like, you know, uncouple and unpack patriarchy and the oppression of women, my whole life, I was surrounded by strong women and my, my family, like Dene, Dene communities are matriarchal. Um, and they're not matriarchal. Like we still have like fucking men do everything public facing, but literally you can talk, like, talk to like any man in the community and it's like yeah I might do all this stuff but like if I do anything wrong you get you get put in your place by the woman the women in the community and in my family it was 
it wasn't even like the men did all the stuff. It was like the women were the, were the badass everything. And my grandmother, um, we all called her mama. Uh, she, she passed away a few years ago at 96. Um, she was the matriarch. She was the ultimate matriarch of the family. And like what mama says is word. And, you know, I, I think about the fact that like she like encouraged us to like challenge these like oppressive structures. She didn't speak barely any English. So like a lot of this was translated through other community members and our other not community, other family members. She also birthed 19 children, by the way. Yeah. Was, if you could see Carla's face, everyone, she's like fainting. Yeah. She, she birthed 19 children. Um, all of them um, forced into residential schools and taken from her, all this stuff. It's like pretty horrible and traumatic, but she was like the strongest woman ever. And I also, my mom was involved in like the drama community and like the writing community. So like Maria Campbell, who wrote like Half Breed. I grew up with like Maria Campbell and like, like, like Sherry Reset, who's like an indigenous artist, like painter and like all of these amazing women that were just like, fuck the system, fuck men, we're going to do all this shit and we're going to be badass about it. And no, we're not fucking feminists. And it was like such a different like way to like relate to the world. But, you know, I've, I've, tr I've been like looking into like writings of indigenous feminism and there's a few, I, I feel like I'm, I'm just trying a huge blank right now on who they actually are. Um, but like, uh, Kim Tallbear is a really, really impressive, like, woman who talks a lot about, like, relationships and sex, and, like, like, when we talk about matriarchal communities, like, it was not uncommon for a woman to just have more than one lover back in the day, and, you know, have, have the husband, uh, but then, you know, he's away for nine months, so I, <laughs> I, I mean, I some of my family might not appreciate this, but like, you know, not all of the children, the 19 children were all my grandfather's Baba, but Baba stayed there till he died. And like, these were just, this is because this is the way things were. And like, how do we uncouple, like these were the feminists that I grew up with. These were the indigenous like feminists that I grew up with that like women are strong and we're critical and we're necessary to the decision-making in our communities. We have, we have real roles and responsibilities, not just to raising our children, but to ensuring that our children are raised in communities that are safe and healthy. And, um, and that you do that, not just by like taking care of the young, but by like fighting and standing up and speaking your mind and saying what you need to and doing the things you need to do. Um, I, I do appreciate a lot of Kim Tolbert's stuff though. I, lo I love her stuff. She, she's been on a million podcasts. You can search her on podcasts too. Uh, she's super great. I think she's written a book as well. And then there's a lot of, lot of like new books coming out with the indigenous teachings of women and they don't equate them to feminisms, but they really are. Um, and I, and I think that's because of the deep, the deep history of white supremacy within the feminist movement. And it's, it's, it's hard for people to make the, the connections because they don't feel comfortable with that. Um, but that's starting to like undo a little bit. I know there's some American indigenous women that have do done some really great work, but again, they're, they're names are slipping my mind right now it's because I've been on sabbatical and I'm like haven't been like thinking about things for a long time but yeah no I think for me it is really just the, the women that I grew up with and just so many more like I, I I grew up with some incredible women like every now and then I'll like hear their names and people will mention them and I'm just like oh I grew up with that person oh yeah that's really cool oh yeah um, and so these these women were really the role models for me to to not only realize that um, that to be a proud indigenous woman, but to be a proud indigenous woman that isn't just about like fighting white supremacy and colonialism, but is also about like unpacking the patriarchy. And the patriarchy is real. Like again, like thinking of Jack Forbes is like it's coming to the we to go disease. We have a lot of that it has been like really put into our movement spaces and it's really critical and important that we talk about that and that we start to unpack how colonization and like this we to go disease has infiltrated our communities and has led to this first further marginalization and oppression of women and particularly women of color and and how we can't just like romanticize like the medicine man type figure or the shaman type figure anymore and that like we have to be really really critical about like how we're moving forward 
in how, who are we uplifting in the Native communities? And who are the voices that have like not spoken up for so long because of these imposed systems of colonization with with those systems of like white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, all those things. And, and like, how do we like uncouple from them? So lots of, uh, I would just say it's too many strong indigenous women to leaders to, to even like think about right now. But I mean, like, even like Robin Wall Kimmerer, like, I don't think she can, she's an ethnobotanist, that's her, you know, her marker but like if you've read her book braiding sweetgrass like it is all about being a strong woman and like doing that shit on her own and she just she just exudes like what it means to be like a strong indigenous woman fighting for justice in in our communities yeah i love her book (laughs) yeah that's beautiful yeah um and the the whole like you know, not calling it uh, feminism, but it reminds me of conversations that I've had with the, a really good friend of mine who's Cherokee and um, talking about like how, well, you know, white anarchism and like white anarchist spaces are really fucked. But like what we call anarchism is something that's been practiced in, you know, communities around the world way before the term anarchy came into being. And so it's like, well, then what do we call it? And how do we, you know, and she, you know, her point being like, well, what do, what do we call it in these like indigenous spaces? And, um, yeah. Uh, and so like kind of also talking about that whole lineage thing and, you know, you mentioned your, your, your grandmother and this idea of, you know, moving that forward. Also, you know, the, the last question here is, uh, is in terms of like younger or emerging um, organizers or even just like a collective that's kind of new um, compared to the time that you've been doing this, like, is there anybody that you wanted to to give a shout out to or that like inspires you not from the the elder portion but from the youth portion i feel like there's so many amazing youth also like this whole like anarchist feminism it's like gets back to that first thing at the beginning where i was like we always want to put like this box like what is the person can tell you whoever discovered water wasn't a fish like it's like what that's anarchism i a last little story on that rant is like i was someone i, I learned I, I love science even though I'm making an indigenous like knowledge, like I, I love like science because I love seeing when science figures out what indigenous people have like known for like millennia. Um, but there was, there's been this new like fringe science called biophilia and biophilia is about like how like we can have like interspecies exchanges, like whether it's a plant or a, an animal or a human and an animal or a human and a plant, whatever. And how like when we sit in relationship with them, we build like language that's beyond like, speaking and I'm just like yeah cool so you put a word on the thing that we've been doing for like ever awesome and uh, and it's like native people like if someone like read about the science of biophilia they're just like oh you figured out what we've been doing for a long time and it's just that idea that we always want to put labels on shit and it just seems so crazy sometimes um but shout out to indigenous youth that are like changing the world and doing shit oh my god there's so many there's so many I feel like if I name a few I'm gonna leave out like ones that I like absolutely love um like literally there's so many uh like Quinn Misaki which I can't always say his name wrong but I said I'm terrible with names and pronunciation he's um he's Algonquin Ojibwe from out east in Ontario he's been doing a lot of work with the Isaac Murdoch camps uh land-based camps out there but he's a language keeper like so he knows the language fluently and he's just like on the land doing amazing work and he's just so humble and so sweet and I think like anyone like I've learned so much from being in his presence. Uh, he's great. I, I think like Takaya Blaney, um, she's uh, Shimsham, Simsham from like West Coast. I have known her since she's like the same age as my son, which is just wild to think about. And like, she's been on the front lines. I've seen her just grow up. And when she speaks, it is the most powerful, like amazing from the heart, like from like, it's not even from the heart, like from the heart just feels so like, individual it's from like the ancestors like when she speaks it's 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 ethereal it's big beyond our comprehension um 
a lot of the my staff on my team, like Kyla, Pascal, and Lindsay Bakagel, and like Nigel, Henry Robinson, uh, Peace to Crane. Like there's all these indigenous youth that I know that I every time like I hear them speak, like sometimes they say things I'm just like, oh, you need to listen to your elders a little bit more. But other times I'm just like, oh yeah, that's it's really that gives me something to think about. And someone once said to me, if you know someone doing this work and they don't have a youth mentor, like someone who's like middle-aged or older and they don't have a youth mentor, then you shouldn't listen to them. And it's really important that we don't just look to our elders and those that have like been through it for the answers. Because as, and as someone who was deep in youth work for so long, like I spent 10 years of my life, like advocating for indigenous youth voices, like it is super critical because they have experiences that are critical to understanding like the future because they are the future and they have experiences that I don't understand. Like I don't understand half of social media half the time. And anytime it's like, what's going to work? I'm like, I don't know what's TikTok. How do I do it? Yeah. Um, and these youth not only know how to engage in technology because they're not going to limit it to technology, but they know how to speak to other youth. They know how to like engage them and bring them into a conversation in a way that I couldn't do. And when they do that and they bring that skill and they learn from the elders and they bring the knowledge into this, they are the ones that are mapping out what our futures look like. And so they, there's just so many youth that are stepping up and sometimes they want to do stuff like that is just like crazy. And I'm just like, okay. But Adrian Marie Brown talked about I she w did this workshop with her once and she talked about how like we have to let our youth make mistakes. We can't try to like protect the world from them and we can't stop them when they're doing something that we might not agree with because it's those mistakes that help build that neuroplasticity and those neural pathways that help them to understand that a they need to make those mistakes and b that like these are the these are critical to developing mechanisms to protect themselves to do these things. And so I've gotten into arguments with people that are like, you need to make sure those youth don't do these things. And I'm just like, or we need to let the youth do those things and like almost take it from like a harm reduction um like approach. Like you don't take away all the tools because they're doing something wrong with them. You just go, okay, I'm here for you if something happens. And I want to support you in this journey. And you can convey your concerns, but you should never try to stop them from doing something. And I think that the, these youth that I talk about are super powerful and super radical because they're doing this work and they're doing it with such grace and with such, um, you know, passion. And they've all made mistakes, all of them. And they've all gotten back up and they, and they all take the time to listen. And uh, last two years ago at our last gathering, I, I'm proud to announce that I'm no longer, um, like being in your forties is such a weird age. Cause it's like, you're not an elder and you're not a youth. So what are you? So I'm, I'm an auntie. Uh, and and I, I, I found myself scolding a bunch of youth two years ago and I got a uh, nickname mean auntie. And that's okay. You know, like you could scold youth and they need to make those mistakes, but they also need to hear like some direction coming forward. Uh, it's not about just letting people run rampant and run wild. It's about like being there and just being like, this is not good for you. Don't do it. And if you're going to continue to do it, you're going to you know, hear more. Um, but also us as old people also need to know, we don't know all the answers, particularly young people have a lot of solutions that we will never have even dreamed of thinking of because we've never had those experiences. Oh my God. Did you see how excited I was <laughs> that all, <laughs> jumping up and down um, at the Purple Thistle, which was a youth run arts and activism center. The only sign we had up on the door was mistakes are encouraged. Oppression will be challenged. Oppressions will be challenged um, because it's, it's just everything right there. Right. How else can you learn <laughs> without uh, falling down a few times? Um, thank you. That was just so wonderful. And the, I'm um, just, that was my favorite thing ever. <laughs> it's like, it's yes, funny. Cause like, you could cheerlead. <laughs> it's really funny. Cause one of the things I got mad at the youth is they, they kept not showing up to the sessions in the morning. And I just like scolded them in front of everybody. I didn't even pull them aside. 
And then they were like, well, you should help us wake up. And I was like, no, I helped you all get here. I made sure you all had food in your bellies and a safe place to sleep. It is your responsibility to step up and make sure you show up and you show some respect to the people that are like doing this work with you. Totally. And like, we need to hear your voices, but that means you need to actually show up and like yeah. be respectful for the people around you. And I think like that's critical. It's like, it, like some people you say stuff like, oh, we need to listen to our youth. It's not about like just like mm -hmm. that harm reduction model is like, they got to make mistakes and we got to be there to help them to, to correct course. Totally. Yeah. And that responsibility is key. It's key. It, what's, it's what comes along with um, centering relationships and um, encouraging youth to have, you know, to be in their power is that then they have to show up with, with responsibility. I think the other thing too, when we, when you think about youth, it's like some, like there's youth as in youth and age, but there's also like those that are new to these spaces and we have to come at them with the same type of compassion and like the, that ability to like that room to make mistakes. But those people also have to come in with humility to know that like, it's okay to make mistakes. And I think like, and also just because you hit a certain age doesn't mean that you're anti or that you're an elder. Like these are earned titles. And I, I, I really want to like emphasize that because I see too many times people referring to people as like elders in communities just because they're old <laughs> and like that title comes with responsibilities and experiences of being respectful and being able to learn from younger generations having those abilities to like have like humility and like let go of ego and all of those things and it's really really important that we just don't respect someone because they've been in the movement for 35 years uh I'm an advocate of like question everything, learn as much as you can and have humility while you do it along the way. And that, that includes people. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to end. <laughs> Unless you have, do you have anything else you'd like to say or um, um, just noticing the time we've taken up so much yeah. of your time and labor? And <laughs> I, I think the, the last piece is just like, I think some people, I just want to name this because like, I don't know, you don't need to include it or not. I don't know, but some people, when they see like indigenous rights movement and they hear land back, they get really confused. And, and I just want to speak to that a little bit because, and I and speak to like, we hear a lot of like catchphrase, catchphrases like decolonization and all of this stuff. And I think land back and decolonization are like two in the same thing because decolonization, if you like break it down, it's like a return of and to the land. And land back is about that. And when I say return of and to the land, it's like, it's not like I'm going to own this now. It's a return to and of the land to the people that were in like these deep relationships with it. And land back is about allowing us in this capitalist property, like ownership system, like we have to have that semblance of, of ownership because it's the only way to have the ability to effectively reestablish those connections with land undisturbed because it's the society we live in and land back is like us being able to freely access our lands to be able to return to and be of the land once again and that is a part of decolonization it's uncoupling ourselves from these structures that have prevented that for generations and i think that the youth have done such a beautiful job in really pushing this land back movement in a beautiful way in which we've seen little pockets of like people actually like giving land back. And I think we need more of that. And we've seen this in the black community in the United States with the farmer, black farmers liberation movements. And we're like, you know, black, black folks are getting like land to garden and to slay. And it's like a healing process because they were like forced to farm. And we need these things. We need these practices and we need to have like reparations and land back is a form of reparations. And we don't want to talk about reparations in Canada because we slavery was easy. It's like there was monetary exchanges, but the millions upon millions of acres that were appropriated and taken and stolen through brutal force um, from indigenous peoples of the Americas there needs to be reparations for that. And not through some like land claim settlement process that I was a part of for years, but through like a, a true reparation systems where we, we achieve land back, whether that's like control over what happens in on our lands, where we see like the implementation of things like UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or we think of completely whole new models in which to achieve that. But the reality is, is that decolonization starts simply from 
uncoupling ourselves from these structures and reestablishing those those relationships with the land again. Definitely leaving that in because I think <laughs> I think especially yeah. here in the uh, in the U.S., like there have been a lot of conversations where people are like, well, 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 where will I go then? And it's like that's not what. <laughs> What do you think we all said when you all came here? Yeah. <laughs> like, where will we go then? Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that there's just needs to be, I think it, most of all, like, I think a lot of people just need to admit that we're in this place. Like, it's like that, the Jack Forbes, we just need to admit that there's this disease exists. And, and from there, we could start to like unpack these things and we could start finding these processes. Like no one not no one. Some people are just like, we'll send you back to Europe. But uh, I, I think like that's the reality is like, there's a lot, there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. Um, and I'm going to shout out one last book before I go. I've been reading some Resma Menicum. I don't know if you've heard of Resma Menicum. He wrote this book called My Grandmother's Hands. Mm -hmm. And for those that are looking for a journey into like working, like through building bridges between like BIPOC folks and starting to build deep allyship. He talks about like that healing of our bodies and our minds. And he's like a somatic um, teacher and a psychologist, but there's so much trauma like within like the European history and those that have inflicted colonization across the globe. And there's a collective healing you all need to do before you really start trying to jump in and try to like things in other people's cultures. And, and like the healing, like the, you've done a lot of harm and yeah, you need to, we need reparations for that, but you all need to like heal from the shit that happened in your own cultures and communities, like the dark ages, like the wars that happened before colonization of other parts of the world happened. And there's a collective like intergenerational trauma that exists within white folks and an intergenerational um, trauma that exists in your own infliction of white supremacy and colonization of, of, onto others that you carry. And you're like a lot of folks are stuck in holding white supremacy and upholding it because it's become so ingrained in the culture. Um, but it's like unpacking that healing. It's like the intergenerational trauma that we have. Like there's lots of, we have addictions problems. We have all sorts of problems that are part of colonization and our intergenerational trauma. And there's all these programs to heal all that. But I don't hear of any programs that are like trying to heal like white psyche and white consciousness from the intergenerational trauma you all have rooted around your imposition of white supremacy and colonization of others. And that work needs to happen. Here, here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like one of the reasons that people that a lot of white folks get uncomfortable when they hear something like land back, it's like, oh, are you afraid that what happened to indigenous people might happen to you? Is that the problem? Like, okay, well then let's unpack that. And why is that terrifying? And why is that not okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. exactly. Silver Threads is recorded in different places across borders. Carla is located in Canada on Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh lands. Eleanor is located here and there, usually either in Sweden or on Piscataway land, now known as Washington, D.C. And our guests join us from around the world. You can find out more about the show and our guests at groundedfutures.com. To learn more about Eleanor's work, visit artkillingapathy.com and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Radical Eleanor. For Carla, follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Joyful Carla. You can also reach out to us at Silver Threads Show at ProtonMail.com. And lastly, if you want to support the making of the show, you can donate over at GroundedFutures.com. Thank you to the Grounded Futures team for supporting us with promotion. All of the schnazzy graphics that you see are created by Jamie Lee Gonzalez. Grounded Futures is a multimedia platform and is produced by Carla Bergman, Jamie Lee Gonzalez, and Melissa Roach. Post-production audio for our show is done by Eleanor Goldfield. The intro and outro music for our show is a song called Floodlight by Eleanor's former band, Rooftop Revolutionaries. Thanks for listening, and now let's go rattle thrones and topple empires. Let's start to